Peggy's family and many colleagues who are here in person and virtually to remember and honor Peggy, her long years of pioneering ministry and the wonderful person that she was. Whether you are here with us in person, viewing the live stream online or watching this recorded service later, we are so glad that you are joining us as we celebrate and give thanks to God for the life and ministry of Peggy Howland. Now hear these words of Holy Scripture by the Apostle Paul from the letter to the Romans. When we were baptized in Christ Jesus, we were baptized into his death. We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might live a new life. For if we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Thanks be to God for this word of truth and hope. Friends, Peggy was clothed with Christ in her baptism, and in the day of Christ's coming, she shall be clothed with glory. Thanks be to God. Our opening hymn this morning is, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. This hymn was chosen by Peggy's nephew, Colin, as particularly appropriate because of Peggy's love of singing and because Colin played it for her shortly before her death. Please stand as you are able, remaining masked, to join in singing hymn number 610. pray. Eternal God, we bless you for the great company of those who have kept the faith, those who have finished their race, and who now rest from their labor. We praise you and give you thanks this day for the abundant life and ministry of our dear sister Peggy, whom you have called and received into your presence. We are blessed and honored to journey along with her through her life of celebration and witness in the fulfillment of her calling and purpose. Help us, O oh God, to believe where we, where we have not seen, trusting you to lead us through our years, knowing that in life or in death, 
we ultimately belong to you. Bring us at last with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly home. Through Jesus Christ, our resurrected Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. My wife, Rosalind, and I had the privilege to be with Aunt Peggy in the final hours of her earthly life. Uh, the afternoon sped by as we found every card and text and Facebook post that had been sent to her to wish her a happy 88th birthday. Then in her final hour, I read to her from the Bible, from the book of Psalms, while Rosalind held her hand. And our first scripture reading this morning is the psalm that I was reading to her as she drew her final breath. Hear the word of the Lord from Psalm 19 to the leader, a psalm of David. The heavens are telling the glory of God, and the firmament proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night declares knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Yet their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In the heavens he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom from his wedding canopy, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and nothing is hid from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect their errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Keep back your servant also from the insolent. Do not let them have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Our, section, our second scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, from verse 22 to 33. Again, hear the word of the Lord. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. 
Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Many people have asked me, how did I first come to know Peggy? Well, I don't recall exactly when, but I do remember where and how. As crazy as it may sound, I met Peggy first online, on Facebook. That's right, on Facebook. Thanks to the many mutual friends that we have across the PCUSA, Peggy would often see my Facebook post and she makes a comment on my post whether she agrees with me or not. I have no idea who this woman was, and I accepted her to be my friend. I never do that. I rarely do that. Why, is she, why was she commenting on my stuff? I asked. Now, as you know, Peggy would not, have, would not hold anything back when she has something to say. She will speak her mind and let people know, let people know whether you like it or not. Even though Peggy and I may have our shares of differences in a good way, growing up in different generations and under different circumstances and cultural upbringings, somehow our paths intersected by the providence of the divine. In spite of our differences, there are many things that we do have in common with each other. First and foremost, we both love Jesus. We both love the church, in particular, the Presbyterian Church. Although honestly, we both had our shares of growing pains and frustrations over the years, as we weave through the systems of bureaucracies and various forms of isms of the institutional church. Peggy had to overcome many challenges and struggles as a young woman sensing her call to the ministry of word and sacraments. In a field that was traditionally and predominantly held by men. Many churches and presbyteries did not want to give Peggy a chance, not even a meeting or interview, even though Peggy was more than qualified than many of her male counterparts. But Peggy refused to take a no to it as an answer and she was determined and feisty to prove everyone wrong. That's Peggy. As Peggy shared with me many of her scuba diving stories, her underwater photography excursions and uh, weddings that she performed, she was definitely not afraid to venture out into the deep and murky water and into the uncharted territory, literally and metaphorically, on various issues of our times today. As a mentor, Peggy often encouraged me that it is okay to be different from others. She would say, you are who you are, and, and there's nothing other can say or do anything about it. It's okay to stand up from the crowd. It's okay to speak up 
when something is not right or is bothering you. And as you know, Peggy will tell you when it's time for you to stand up and speak up, and when it's time for you to sit down and shut up. Peggy and I also crossed each other's path at the General Assembly of the Peace USA. We're both considered the GA junkies because we care about the mission of the church. At almost every GA that we attended together, we would make time to sneak out of the assembly and spend some quality time catching up with one another over sushi. Peggy's proudest moment of me was when I was asked to speak before the assembly on my personal experience on racism here in America. I believe that was in 2016 in Portland. I remember Peggy went around snapping pictures of the, the giant screen TV and, and, and telling people that I was her Chinese son. And she was proud to be my white American mother. But in all seriousness, Peggy has been there throughout every step of my journey. She encouraged me and supported me as she reflected upon the struggles and challenges of her past. She would often lament, however, saying, how far have we come? And there are still so much more we have to do. Last but not least, Peggy and I also share our mutual love of the Yankees. I, I recall my very first face-to-face -face meeting with her was at Yankee Stadium. And as always, Peggy stood out from the crowd. She made her presence known, or make her presence felt as she literally pushed her way through the crowd with her walker. As she cheered and sang God Bless America and danced the YMCA and getting herself onto the jumbotron. Her favorite Yankee heroes were Derek Jeter and Lou Gehrig, who was nicknamed the Iron Horse because of his perseverance and persistence while overcoming many of his challenges, just like Peggy. Well, as Lou Gehrig shared on his final farewell speech on July 4th, 1939, Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of this earth. I may have had a tough break, but I have an awful lot to live for. Indeed, Peggy, you sure had an awful lot to live for as well. You have been a trailblazer, a pioneer, while paving the waves for others to follow. You stood up when other people were telling you to sit down. You've encouraged so many, including me, to pursue their dreams in spite of the many setbacks, obstacles, and roadblocks that were put up against them. You were indeed a legendary iron horse of ministry, as you have exemplified it throughout your life. No doubt, we will continue to run this race that you have now completed. Thank you, Peggy, for simply being you. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and share your master's happiness.
Thank you, Samson, and thank you to Keith for the readings today. As Keith explained, he chose Psalm 19. I chose the reading from Matthew today because of a story that Peggy told me many times. Peggy Howland had a great big heart full of love. If I could sum up her ministry in three little words, it would be, God loves you. Or rather, God loves us, each one of you, each one of us. But of course, Peggy knew that when love, genuine love, God's love comes for you, it is not always soft spoken or easy on the ear, and neither was she. But she also knew that God's love is all-inclusive, empowering, reassuring, and life-giving. One of my favorite memories of Peggy was years ago when she taught me to preach. She had me stand right here in this great high pulpit with, to read without a microphone one of my early sermons, and she went way back to the far back of this huge sanctuary. And she kept yelling, louder, 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 until I thought I was bellowing and Peggy was finally satisfied. I learned from Peggy that if you are going to dare to proclaim God's word, be bold. There was only one photo that I asked Samson to include in the slideshow that you saw before this service, or you may see later. That was the photo of the stained glass window at the Union Church in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, where Peggy was ordained in 1958. This window, of course, illustrates the story from Matthew in our gospel reading today. When I was looking through Peggy's photos that she posted on Facebook, I saw that she had posted that particular photo at least four times in the last few years. Peggy loved that window because she loved that story. As she told me often, that was her story. Like Peter, Peggy was fiery, passionate, and devoted to Jesus. Like Peter, when Jesus called to her, she got out of the boat. Peggy was a way paver for so many because she simply got out of the boat over and over again. But like Peter, once she got out of the boat, sometimes Peggy felt overwhelmed by the waves and the wind. In those moments of panic, Peggy prayed for help, and Jesus was there. Always, Jesus was there for her, asking, why did you doubt? I remember once when Peggy gave a children's message on water safety right here on this chancel. She wore a big PFD, a personal flotation device, and explained how important it was. But for Peggy, Jesus was her PFD. Of all that Peggy taught me, the most important is that when Jesus calls, like Peter, we need to get out of the boat. The boat, of course, can be different things. It can be what others expect of us, what is comfortable. It might be our privilege, our prestige, or power. But when Jesus calls, we have to get out of the boat. Over the years, I've found courage in Peggy's example to step into uncertainty, keeping my eyes on Jesus. Whether it was helping to organize the Black Lives Matter March here in White Plains, or the local March for Our Lives, or just simply standing by my convictions in little things, Peggy's example has inspired me over and over and over again. Peggy's efforts were always on the cutting edge, or what some might call the margins, where she felt called 
to advocate for those in need and work for justice and peace. Hearing recent news reports, we all know Peggy would be out demonstrating right now if she could. In a blog post she wrote for this presbytery in 2017, Peggy recounted her experience in, experiences co-founding the clergy consultation service in the Capital District of New York State. Peggy worked for years to make abortions safe and legal. When she was asked what she would do after that was accomplished, in her own words, she wrote, there has always been more to do. Today, I can almost hear Peggy saying, you've simply got to get out of the boat. To the glory of God, amen. And now we will hear from, oh, excuse me. Now we will sing our next hymn verses 1, 2, and 4 of How Great Thou Art, hymn number 625. Please stand as you are able, remaining masked, to sing.
Hello. Can everyone hear me? Thank you everyone for coming. And I also want to send out love to all the people affected by COVID. Two of my own family members aren't here today, partially because of it. So when I thought about reading here, I was like, how do I describe my Aunt Peggy? Well, she was always crazy, Aunt Peggy, and she liked to call herself that more than anyone. She loved being an aunt and she loved her nieces and nephews and grand nieces and nephews. And I've also learned about all the adopted children she had in her church that she helped mentor along the way. For me, she was always larger than life. I was her baby brother's daughter and she was his big sister, but she always seemed so old, but she did all these really cool things. She was a large, loud woman that loved a good argument and would be willing to take my dad on, which when I was little was pretty, it was something. She was a minister that didn't talk like a minister. She swam with sharks. She'd bring her full slide projector and show us her scuba pictures. And as she came and named her 50th fish and was just about losing us, she'd throw in a shark and get all of our attention again. She loves sharks and she was, has published pictures of her with sharks. I grew up in the time of Jaws and no one wanted to swim with sharks except my crazy Aunt Peggy. She was on the front of a Wheaties box for me, or at least one her family had made, but I always remembered my Aunt Peggy on the front of a Wheaties box with her scuba outfit on. And if any of you knew her then, I'm sure you have Wheaties recipes and maybe even some boxes still in your basement. I remember too that she used to pack up her Camaro and after writing this, I don't even know if it was a yellow Camaro she had, but as a kid, that's how I remembered it. She'd pack up her yellow Camaro and camping we would go. I remembered as a fast yellow Camaro that could go anywhere. It would speed all over the city and then off road right up to the camping site. We also, every time, Lori and I were just talking about this last night, every time coming back into Pennsylvania, she had a certain song that we would sing that ended pretty much with Pennsylvania. But it started with hanging a man on a sour apple tree. And there again, there's my minister aunt having us sing this song every time coming back into Pennsylvania. I also remember New Year's Eve in New York. I thought she wanted to spend time with me, but it was probably to give my parents time off on New Year's Eve. We banged pots and pans out on the balcony and she would take me rides through the city. And it was actually my first education in seeing a prostitute that she pointed out to me, but she did it from the point of there was a woman doing what she needed to do to survive. And, I, and I've always had that odd viewpoint now. At 19, I was in a horrible car accident. With all her international connections and the people that love her all over the world, I felt as if the world was praying for me. If you knew my aunt in 1989, you were one of the people praying, so thank you. Because of this car accident, graduate school took a lot longer for me than I thought. As an adult, I stayed with her every third weekend while I attended the Dominican College in New York. First, we stayed in her three-story, eight-bedroom church house that had a dungeon and was really scary. And some weekends, I had to stay there by myself. I'd go right up to my room. And if you knew my Aunt Peggy too, she was a collector. She always made sure my bed was clean and I had a safe place to stay. Saturday nights, we would do dinner out in the city and half the fun was just getting there in her Subaru. Um, once even having children, um, I got to experience Disney with my kids and her in a scooter, which was an event in itself. Um, as an adult now, I, um, with my Ghanaian husband, we have a foundation, Garaba's Hands, which helps put girls in Ghana through school. And right away when she learned about it, she sent me a giant check and without any prompting or anything. So we set up a foundation in her name where one girl every year we pay for her education through the entire school year. Um, and it's normally based on uh, educational need and her grades. As I got older, I came to understand the ceiling she broke and she was my first feminist influence. There were no places women couldn't go. My Aunt Peggy shaped me as a woman. I'm a woman who fights against injustices passionately with 100% of me, and sometimes it gets in my way too. 
She would put her own safety in jeopardy to make sure women can make choices with their own bodies. I hope she can still pull some influence from up there. She ignited my interest in the ocean, and I am now a snorkeler and scuba diver, and my kids both snorkel. And now I swim with sharks. I took my son last summer to Mexico to swim with the whale sharks off the coast of Cancun. As soon as I got home, I called my Aunt Peggy and told her all about it. And she told me then about the Red Sea. So that's my next goal, to dive the Red Sea. I'm a camper too, and when I first became single, I remembered Aunt Peggy packing up five kids to go off camping in what I remembered as her Camaro. So I thought, oh, I can definitely do two. So right away, I felt comfortable being able to take my kids camping. I also really need to thank Keith and Rosalyn for being there with Aunt Peggy at the end. I am so grateful, and my heart goes out to you guys, and that rainbow was for you. So I wear this dress, Aunt Peggy, because I celebrate you. You are a strong woman force in my life. I went to Ghana last November to celebrate the life of my father-in-law, and this is our family's pattern. I wear this dress as my Aunt Peggy would want a celebration of life, as I celebrate all the things that made her special to me. Thank you. My, I'm short. My name is Jane, and I am Peggy's sister. First, I would like to thank White Plains Presbyterian Church, Reverend Lynn Dunn and Reverend Sampson So for planning the service and all the support and help they have given over the years to my sister Peggy and now to me. And special thanks to our nephew Colin. I know Peggy is listening in heaven and is so delighted that he is playing the organ for her. There were five of us, my three brothers, Tom, Bill, and John, and also Peggy and me, with an age spread of 16 years from my oldest brother, Tom, to my youngest brother, John. We were blessed with two community-minded parents as role models who were, who were actively involved as leaders in their community and their church. Peggy often told the story that she waited nine years for a sister to arrive, and when I did, all I did was sleep. I did not realize until recent conversations with my older brothers how often they played sports together, leaving my sister behind. I now know why she told this story so often and why we had a special relationship. Peggy was always among the top of her class and active in all sorts of activities. I was just looking through her high school yearbook. As we grew up in Philadelphia, we were active in church activities. Peggy graduated among the top of her class from Frankfurt High School and then attended University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, where she received an award for all the activities during her four years in college. She graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a major in ancient Middle Eastern history. She was the only woman and the only non-Jewish student in her classes. She went on to graduate from Princeton Theological Seminary, where she had thought that serving God as a woman was to become a missionary. But while in seminary, the Presbyterian Church voted to allow women to become ministers in the United States, so my sister became the 12th ordained woman minister in the Presbyterian Church. The best present you could give Peggy was stamps. Peggy wowed her nieces and nephews with slides and frequent postcards from far off places. Everyone wanted to travel and see the world as their Aunt Peggy did. My sister was ordained in Brooklyn at Union Church at Bay Ridge in 1958, where she served as assistant pastor. I remember that well because I visited her the year that I turned 16 and I had just gotten my license and my sister let me drive in New York traffic. <laughs> and actually someone in the next car started to laugh when they looked at me because I think I also looked young. 
Peggy served two other large congregations and then studied for a master's at Union Theological Seminary, from which she graduated cum laude in sacred theology studying psychiatry and religion. Peggy then spent two and a half years trying to get a pastoral interview until an, ex an executive in Albany Presbytery gave her an interview and a chance. She was installed as the pastor of Woodside Presbyterian Church in Troy, New York in 1969. Peggy was the first woman to be installed as a pastor in the Presbyterian Church of over 200 people. And this happened 17 years after women had been admitted to the clergy. She went on to serve two other congregations in Hudson River Presbytery, Narashan Presbyterian Church, and then for 20 years at South Presbyterian Church in Yonkers until she retired in 1998, after which she became associate pastor at White Plains Presbyterian Church. About 10 years ago, she moved to Orlando to reside at Westminster Towers Retirement Community, where once again Peggy became a force. I can remember when Peggy was being installed at South Presbyterian Church in Yonkers that a speaker addressed the congregation and said, you must learn to share Peggy. She has so much to offer. Others will tell you about her many awards and her passions. She served as commissioner to and on many committees of the General Assembly and as moderator of the Synod of the Northeast. Locally, she served as a chaplain, as part of the clergy consultation service, and as a member of the Power Squadron. She had a love for Yankees and, as has been mentioned before, a beautiful singing voice. She absolutely loved to sing. When we were cleaning out her apartment, I found a few notes that Peggy wrote about her legacy. My immaterial legacy is, one, being a drop of water that added to other drops of water, growing into a river that broke many log jams as one of the first women ministers in the Presbyterian Church. Two, working for women's rights, especially reproductive rights, and for LGBTQ rights. Three, influencing and supporting women in church ministry throughout the world. Four, being an example and a role model for girls growing up, letting them see what women can do and be. And five, teaching my nieces and nephews that giving to important causes is even better than material gifts. I would also like to leave a legacy of writing a book to share my faith in the grace and love of God, helping people with behavioral addictions to know that asking for help is important and that it works, and getting seniors involved in active nonviolent protest. I want to tell you that the sadness of Peggy's death has been mixed with great joy for me. I have had the privilege of hearing from and reading many comments about what Peggy has meant to them in their lives. One thing above all stands out, that Peg not only led the way, but she also lent a hand up to everyone behind her. I have read so many wonderful comments about Peggy and I would like to finish by reading just one. Oh dear Peggy Howland, you have been quiet on Facebook lately and now we learn that you are no longer with us on this earthly plane. I hope you are ready for this entry. One of the feistiest, funniest, most passionate justice lovers I have ever known. Like Patrick Evans said, I hope that whomever meets you at the gate has the right paperwork because you really do not like to cross Peggy. You are always a force to contend with. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Cindy Coleman and I serve as the Connectional Presbyter and Stated Clerk for Newcastle Presbytery and have the honor of serving as co-moderator of the 223rd General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church USA. And it's in that office that I join you today. I met Peggy fairly recently, unlike so many of you, uh, and I'm sad for that. I'm sad I did not know her longer. 
When I met her in 2018, it was during the process of standing for co-moderator with my sister, Biomarie Centrono Olivieri. We were at the National Association of Presbyterian Clergywomen gathering in Montreat. And I noticed that there was a woman who was seated, struggling with the ability to move without great pain, and that all the other women at this conference revolved around her. Having never met her, I knew just from watching that she was a presence and a force, that she had power within herself and great respect from her colleagues. I talked with her off and on during that conference, but the memory that stays with me was the shuttle back to the airport. And if you've ever been to Montreat and have taken the shuttle, you know it's a ride. It's not a fast trip. And we were on an early morning shuttle. Peggy uh, was out of breath and cranky from an early morning wake up and feeling rushed and uncomfortable and lost her patience. She was sitting in the passenger seat uh, with the shuttle driver taking that van through the mountain roads. I don't even remember what he said, but she erupted. Whatever he said, touched her heart and touched her love for the LGBTQ community. The, the pain of the deaths and the violence at the Pulse nightclub was still reverberating within her and, and whatever it was he said touched that wound. And she lashed out as Peggy could with, with fierce love for people that she held as brothers and sisters and siblings, and she let him know. I was sitting in the back. I thought we were going to be dropped off on the side of the road. I thought this man is going to pull over and stop the car and tell us to get out. Once Peggy said her passionate response. She took a breath and then engaged in conversation. We were not dropped off at the side of the road. And when we arrived at the airport, the driver was especially careful and solicitous with her. Both her passion, her deep, fierce love and her ability to seek to draw people in so that they could have the opportunity to change were on display in that drive. And so on behalf of this denomination, this denomination that took too long to recognize the gifts of women in ministry and finally came around, this denomination that took too long to recognize the gifts of our LGBTQIA plus siblings and finally came around. This denomination that is seeking to be a force for peace and justice in this world on behalf of this denomination that Peggy loved and gave her heart and her energy, intelligence, imagination, and love to, I want to say thank you. She led the way in so many ways. She challenged us with her life and witness that we could be fierce too, that we could indeed be people so deeply in love with Jesus and so deeply in love with our neighbors that we could together change the world. At the risk of being blasphemous, I hope and pray that more than a double portion of Peggy's spirit has been left behind. That women and men and siblings across this country and yes, this world will continue to rise up, stand for justice for all people, call for peace that is lasting and real and seek Seek that beloved community 
that Peggy so fiercely believed was possible and that she brought with her wherever she went. I echo my colleagues, well done, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your witness. Thank you for your bright and shining light. Thank you for your fierce love. Thank you for your challenge. Thank you for your tenacity. Thank you. And may we take up that mantle and continue with that fierce love that you showed us. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 Good morning. My name is Equia Boateng from South Presbyterian Church, Yonkers, where Reverend Margaret Peggy Howland served as a pastor for 19 years. I am her African daughter. Reverend Margaret Howland, Pastor Emeritus, first came to South Presbyterian Church, Yonkers, as a stated supply on October 1st, 1979 to November 30th, 1980. She was then installed as South Pastor on December 1st, 1980, and retired November 30th, 1998. Over the years, she did perform many duties like baptisms, confirmations, receiving new members, ordinations, installation of deacons and elders, which myself and my family, my children benefited from that. Many activities like luncheons and fairs. I do not know about the elders over here, your session meetings, but those days our session meetings run long, and I mean long. We have to take breaks. And she made sure that she brought big goods for the breaks, and this went on every month that we had session meeting. She did do Christmas Eve caroling with some of the youth at that time, which she loved doing. She celebrated three milestone um, anniversaries with this. Our 75th anniversary 85th anniversary, which she was a pastor then, and our 100th anniversary, which we invited her and she accepted and came and preached for us when she was retired. Reverend Harland was a chaplain for Yonkers Nursing Homes and was one a moderator for uh, Hassan, River, Hassan River Presbytery. As some of us know, and we all heard about it, she was an avid scuba diver, and she did not waste time showing us her slide. Every chance that she had, she had to show us the slide. She was not just a pastor to the congregation. She was a mother, a grandmother to most of us. And some of us just received a lot of postcards from many of her trips. I do have a whole album full of her postcards still. While she was a minister, we did get a gift from the family. Greg, I don't know whether he is here, gave us um, a copier machine. And we still have the alarm system, which was donated in her my father's memory. 
to their family. We thank you for sharing here with us. May she rest in peace. Thank you. Hi, my name is Emily Brewer, and until the end of April, I was the executive director of the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, which is how I got to know Peggy Howland. Peggy was a member of PPF um, and an advocate for peace with justice in the Peace USA and the world um, with PPF since 1968. Uh, I think when she died, she had been um, the longest active member of PPF. Um, and it feels like a huge loss um, that she's no longer in this world in the same way with us. Um, when Peggy, in, in 2018, the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship gave one of our awards to Peggy. It's called the Ann Barstow and Tom Driver Award for Excellence and Nonviolent Direct Action in Retirement uh, to Peggy, and for lots of reasons, which I'll talk about in a second. But um, a lot of times when I have gotten to call and tell people that we want to give them this award and ask if they'll accept it, they kind of were like, oh, I don't want the spotlight, which is understandable. Um, and Peggy was like, great, cool, let's start planning because I got some ideas. Um, and uh, what I love that story about Peggy is that it um, shows not that she was arrogant, um, but that she, she wasn't modest either. Um, she was confident and she was like sure of herself. And I can only imagine that it took a lot of work and faith to maintain that kind of self value and confidence um, and self assuredness in the face of the so many struggles and obstacles that she faced um, to be a woman ordained in the Presbyterian Church. And in an early conversation that I had with Peggy when I first knew her, so probably in about 2015, maybe even earlier, she told me that she, when she died, wanted to be remembered as a way paver. And that, I wrote it on a sticky note. I had it for years. I think I lost it in a recent move, but now it's just kind of emblazoned on my brain. Um, that she wanted to be remembered as somebody who fought really hard, um, in the case that we were talking about, to be ordained. And, and then that she helped make the road wider for the people who came after her. And she did that. Um, she did it not only for women, which I can attest to. My experience of being ordained um, was not always easy, but was certainly so much easier than hers because of Peggy and others like her who had fought hard to make the road wider for those of us who came after them. So she did that for women, and she also did it for queer people. She fought really hard um, in the movement alongside queer siblings um, for inclusive ordination, and that was one a few years ago. Um, and I also think about, especially in this week, uh, I'm recording this the week that the Supreme Court decision was leaked and it's looking like Roe versus Wade is going to be overturned by the end of the summer. Um, Peggy was also a way paver in her activism and advocacy around reproductive justice. You all probably know, but if you don't, she was a part of the clergy consultation service. Um, in New York as a pastor, and that was a group of clergy who counseled and accompanied women seeking abortions before it was legal. Um, and I just think about the kind of way paving that that does in so many ways, both on like a advocacy level, um, it kind of normalizes abortions and, and reproductive justice, um, but also way paving in that like for many of those individual people, I imagine that she helped make the, the way easier um, by accompanying them and by being a clergy person, using the power of being a clergy person to um, say that abortion is also a moral choice. And like, that's really powerful and it's still pretty incredible. Um, I think she also, she was one of the only women in the clergy consultation service for a long time and it had been the clergy men consultation service and she helped fight to get the men part dropped, which I also love that piece of her story. Um, but I just want to say, in, in, as I wrap up, that Peggy wrote a piece reflecting on her experiences in the clergy consultation service. Um, and at the very end, the very last line that she said, there has always been more to do. Um, and I so admire the way that Peggy saw herself as a part of a larger movement um, 
fighting for the rights and thriving of people and that that was piecework. That is peacemaking work. Um, and it's an honor um, to be to have Peggy as an example, as a friend, as a mentor, um, to inspire all of us to keep picking up the work because as she says, there has always been more to do. Thanks. I wish that I could be with all of you in person to celebrate the life of Peggy Howland. I've thought a lot about Peggy over the last year as I've gone through a transition of my own and uh, worked through an awful lot of change in my life given the realities of the pandemic and uh, just all the disruption that it's caused for me and for so many others. And I've thought a lot about um, those moments when I felt closest to Peggy, which often happened in moments where there was a flash of anger for her. And, you know, some folks would respond to that anger with fear and others with anger of their own. And I eventually learned with Peggy that when those moments happened, if I could just pause for a moment and take a deep breath, and ask Peggy if everything was all right, often the response that I got was tears. There was usually some kind of pain just below the surface that Peggy was masking in those moments of exasperation or frustration with others. And eventually I learned, as I got to know Peggy better and better, that she lived with a lot of pain, that she was in almost constant physical pain for many years, and that sometimes the pain was entirely debilitating for her. Often the pain meant that she couldn't breathe. She literally was having a hard time breathing. In fact, I remember an incident that I've shared over the years with some folks about uh, one of those kind of flashpoints uh, for her that took place at Ghost Ranch. And we eventually figured out that the challenge for her at Ghost Ranch was she just didn't get enough oxygen and she was having a hard time breathing every day. So, you know, Peggy was an adventurer she pushed herself beyond any reasonable limits. She was a scuba diver, for, for goodness sake, and, and she was out there on the front lines of demonstrating and, and giving her all for the cause of justice and peace and full inclusion in the world. And I am so grateful for her witness. And I celebrate her life. Even those moments when sometimes she got on folks in a way that felt inappropriate to me. Um, because I know that uh, Peggy's gift was to be able to work through the pain and to keep on going, and she accomplished far more than we should expect of any reasonable person. So today, as you all remember Peggy and celebrate her life, know that I'm with you and celebrating as well. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lynn, so much for inviting me to White Plains Presbyterian Church, where I can give honor to Peggy. It was really in October 20th, 2018, that I was honored to speak about her. It was called Making a Way in the Wilderness, and it was at the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship at Stony Point Center. I learned so much about her. I thought I knew a lot about her, but these are the things that most stuck out for me. Peggy was one of the people that understood what it is when people are called marginalized or second class. She had done great work on racism and sexism and heterosexism. So in doing that kind of work, she, whether she was in Colombia working on the accompaniment program, whether she was in Japan in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, she wanted to go to Japan. She wanted to understand what had happened there. She went there many times, and every time she came back, she spoke out against nuclear weapons and what they do to people. Some of the great moments of her life, of course, were when she stood up for women and became ordained. Her first two churches, she did Christian education. And after that, she said, I am going to be a pastor. This is what I want to do. She went to 11 presbyteries and said no to 40 assistant minister positions because she knew that she was to be a pastor. And wouldn't you know, in 1968, she met the Presbyterian Peace Fellowship, and these were the folks who understood and were like her, passionate about justice. 
So with that, in 1968, she finally got the position of being the first Presbyterian woman pastor with over 200 people in membership in her congregation. She was able to do work biblically on women and the issues that went around with women. She was for civil rights. She was for against the war in Vietnam. And of course, she always talked about abortion and a woman's right to choose. It's all those things. But in her last years in Florida, she joined the Orlando Gay Chorus. She did that because she loved to sing and she loved to be with people. And it didn't matter what their sexual orientation was. So when she went to Puerto Rico with that Orlando Gay Chorus, they asked her to tell her story. There were those that told their stories about being lesbian and gay, but Peggy told her story of what it is to be an ally. Oh, Peggy, Peggy, what you have done for so many people who were called second class, who were labeled less than, you were right in there treating us all as equals because you know what it was like to navigate patriarchy and misogyny yourself. So thank you. We will miss you, especially right now when we are looking at so many issues that are dividing this country. We need your fight for liberation and justice. So I'm sure you're doing that from heaven's side. I have no doubt about it. So blessings, dear friend. Thank you, thank you for who you are and what you have done for people like me so that we might find our voice too. Blessings to you. Hi everyone, I'm Ray Bagnuolo and it's an honor to have a couple of minutes of your time today to share my my thoughts and love and, and great admiration for Peggy Howland, who, um, like many of you, has made a, a powerful influence in my life from the moment I met her to this day still. And rather than listen to my raspy voice as I get over some of this stuff that's going around, I went back to a video I took uh, in Peggy's home in April of 2015, April 24th, 2015 and just took a few snippets that I think express what I would have liked to have told you about Peggy that you can see for yourself and that I'm sure you already know. Um, I, I especially watching these and compiling it was reminded of her experience, strength and hope. How once we found out that we both shared a 12 step program, different ones, but the same program, that there was a connection that it was all about that. It was all about being the voice for others who didn't have a voice about saying yes, about seeing God in our lives in ways that are mysterious and wonderful and sometimes hard and not losing our energy or our joy for what it is we've been called to do. And Peggy certainly expresses all of that and more in these few clips that I will, um, that I offer today. So my love to you all. Hello everybody. And, uh, and, and also my condolences for all of us for the loss of our friend but you know we know and i'm so grateful for all the joy and the the love that she is surrounded with now and i am sure i am sure that she's somewhere in this gathering at this very moment so god bless you all and thanks again for this time and i hope you enjoy these clips wow 2003 which was witness our welcome at the University of Pennsylvania. It was my first time to be with gays and lesbian and transgender people and, and allies um, of all different churches and denominations, a huge gathering. And I was a little scared because um, I, I just didn't know what to expect, but it was amazing. And I remember the worship and they were the most joyful worship services I'd ever been to. And here were these folks who knew 
that God loved them and they were in a safe place to worship. As being active in the Presbytery of Hudson River, I was aware of a number of gay and lesbian clergy in our presbytery. And as these discussions came up when voting on things and talking about them, I knew that those of them who were in the closet couldn't speak. And I felt that I had to. And I, I resented it a little bit <laughs> because I thought, they'll think I'm gay. And of course, now that doesn't matter to, I consider it a compliment if somebody thinks I'm gay. But well, I was really, really privileged uh, since I'm a GA junkie and have gone to, I think it's like 37 general assemblies. Um, I was really privileged when the Presbytery of Hudson River asked me if I would be the overture advocate for, um, for the, the last amendment, which finally brought about the end of G60106B. And it was a great experience. I said when I was coming here that I was being sent as a missionary and I did not realize how true that was going to be because since I've been in Orlando, God has given me a new mission. And uh, uh, can you see my shirt in your picture? I'm wearing the 25th anniversary shirt of the Orlando Gay Chorus because I have been for a year and a half now a member of the Orlando Gay Chorus. Um, uh, it's wonderful. They accept straight people to sing with them, too. And this is the Orlando Gate Chorus. About 125 people are dedicated to a mission of changing hearts and minds. And this is our 25th anniversary concert coming up in two months. And I am so privileged to be part of it. Um, and to be in a group where there is total acceptance the same kind of total acceptance I found among the LGBT organizations in the church. And because I saw that at that WOW conference in 2003, that, that because these friends know what it's like to be discriminated against and to be judged and to be overlooked and to be pushed aside, there is such total acceptance. There is a love and acceptance for people in the church who don't understand and who are not accepting and including and a, and a kind of a loving them into a new relationship and new understandings. And uh, this has been just the most amazing thing for me. One of the richest experiences of my life. And this is my mission these days. I'm, I'm still working hard on racism and sexism and gun toting. And God has given me a new mission for an 81 year old. So it makes me smile. Friends, we are about to offer our prayer of thanksgiving and the Lord's Prayer, which will be a conclusion to what has already been a period of thanksgiving and a period of prayerful witness bearing. But first, I would like to invite you in a few moments of silence to give thanks to God, your personal thanks to God, for all of whom Peggy was to you. And then we will give thanks for our memories and move into prayer.
For Peggy's life and for our memories, we give thanks to you. And now, O God, before whom generations rise and pass away, we praise you for all of your servants who, having lived this life in faith, now live eternally with you. Especially we thank you for Peggy, whose baptism is now complete in death. We praise you for the gift of her life, for all in her that was good and kind and faithful, and for the grace that you gave to her to be a way maker and a peace seeker and a justice bringer, to not only see but to identify with those who are marginal everywhere, to be an advocate for joy, to share a fierce love of family with an expansive understanding of family, to work through pain, to be vulnerable for the sake of your realm and your way, to both work incredibly hard and to give you the glory as well, to be the formidable force that she was, all of which enabled her to serve you so faithfully. We thank you that for her, death is past and all pain is ended, and that she has now entered the joy that you have prepared for her through her Lord Jesus Christ. So give to us now the strength and the courage to leave her in your care, confident in your promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We trust that there is nothing in the world as it is, or the world as it shall be. Nothing in all creation that can separate us from the love of God we know in Christ Jesus, through whom we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you, as you are able to stand, let us sing our concluding hymn together, number 326, For All the Saints.
following this, following the blessing, the family and clergy will proceed outdoors to the side of the church building to our shepherd's fold for the committal of Peggy's remains to the earth. Following the postlude, those who wish to join us may come out through either the front or side doors. We will wait for you there. Now let us pray. You only are immortal, creator and maker of all. We are mortal, formed of the earth, and to earth we shall return. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with all your saints, where there is neither pain, nor sorrow, nor sighing, but there is life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant Peggy. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive her into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and to the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. And now, may God, in endless mercy, bring the whole church, the living and departed, to a joyful resurrection in the fulfillment of the eternal kingdom. Amen.
Those who wish may join us for the committal service just outside this wall, out through the door here or the side door here. We'll begin in just a moment.